looking to really get to the core of these issues, to look at what it is, what the background is, where it is now, and potentially really where is it going in the future? Who are going to be the big players? And so this is what tonight is all about. Our first one is on watching. A couple of you, I think, are we're here actually. It's a great second turnout from people, second diners. And tonight, we're going to be diving into a whole different area. So, so I would love just to start a little bit. <laughs> Tell us about how you got involved in the ecospace and the aerospace and growth. Well, thank you, Carolyn. It's such an honor to be here tonight. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, again, my name is Diane Aerospace. To Diane Aerospace. <laughs> 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 I'm And um, I'm a senior vice president and an investor in one of the board of directors of a company called Buy Aerospace. And um, Buy Aerospace has been around 10 years, believe it or not. And we have tried a lot of different things. But what we are focusing on now, we finally really got our ceilings underneath us, is that we are um, bringing electric propulsion to all types of, of aviation. And that ranges from um, small drones to high altitude drones to general aviation aircraft. And so I'm happy to get into that a little bit more. But, what introduced me to this ecosystem, I love that term, it's, it's uh, 10 years ago, um, I, I was, I did this, um, I would call it amateur angel investing, and I had um, realized that I, I very much enjoyed it because I loved the opportunities to learn. And so I happened to um, be introduced to George Biden, who was our founder and CEO, and he was in an industry that was poised to embrace this new um, evolution in going from traditional internal combustion engines to electric propulsion. And much like what happened in the ground transportation industry with places in electric cars, aviation um, industry talked about that this would make a whole lot of sense for a lot of different reasons, and again, we discuss that a little bit more. But I love the lavish thing the company. Um, somebody needs to and um, revolutionizing this industry. And Jordan is very much willing to be that big person. It's not always easy to be the first leading edge, leading edge uh, company to do this. And so I was really attracted to the opportunity to take an industry like general aviation and aerospace and you know, to come in and to say, we are going to make this change. There's so much goodness that can result from introducing the right compulsion and the option. And um, I just said, I, this is where I want to be. And I'm personally not a pilot. Your planes are cool. I have to like cars. Um, I married a retired Air Force guy. He was also not a pilot. Um, but this is a passionate industry. And I felt that the, um, the, the passion and the knowledge and the level of education that people in this industry can have was very much what to be needed to go through this type of a revolution. It seems like uh, experimental airplanes are more popular than ever. I did, what was it, kind of a terrifying Google deep dive into this industry? <laughs> and, you know, sort of like Googling, um, I have a call with Roman with me. It was very similar, this sort of the amazing amount of results that come out of a simple question. Yeah. So, what do you believe is the current thought process for a future of air, airplanes and aerospace? So, I believe that um, um, this is not an easy industry. Um, and I'll give an example of the most popular, the most produced aircraft of all time is the Cessna 172. It's a technically a five-seat airplane, but chances are if you're at Centennial Airport and you look up, you're probably going to see the Cessna 172. There were 40,000 of those aircraft uh, produced since that airplane was introduced in, I would say, the late 1950s. Um, and it pretty much looks the same way, design-wise, as it was introduced that long time ago. Um, and why do you ask? Well, it's because they haven't had to have a design change. In the airlines, excuse me, the aviation industry, general aviation, and certainly the, the big commercial air, airplanes as well, when you go through a design change, you have to get it certified through the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. And that is a laborious, expensive process. 
So companies like Tesla that produces the 172 said, you know, we don't really have to make it with the right people until they have it. And so oftentimes if you're going to get um, to take flight pilots away from the buses, you're likely going to be in a Cessna 172 that is decades old, maybe even close to 1960. And so that's just how it's been because when this require a force to change. And so what we're doing at my is to say it's so much more cost effective, it's quieter, no emissions, this makes all kinds of sense. And so um, again, this industry in general is just really um, more position for positive change. Um, and then it just takes um, taking a serious look at it and saying um, the battery energy densities are capable now enough to support life that hasn't always been the case. It's not great yet, but it's getting there quickly. Um, so, again, as I look at potential investments, it's those types of quality that um, are really willing to change you know, the technology that they're just needs to be here and the integrated, which is really what we do with our are one of a few in the space right now that's trying to make this world of aerospace that doesn't seem like it's changed that much. Um, we have, <laughs> again, just been in the industry notoriously is the Boeing's and the Lockheed Martins have just always been done this way. It takes a billion dollars to develop a new, uh, a new military um, airplane. And so um, what, we're, what we're saying is we, we, we know what can be done more cost efficiently and effectively. And so, um, you know, we just have a, just a different um, take charge, we're going to do it attitude, and, and it's really starting to stick um, as recently as three or four years ago. Um, you know, the scene in the, the, the popular Christmas movie, the Christmas story, where I see people go, you're going to shoot your eye out. That's, that's the comment that we would get, you know, you're never going to fly over to this one. It's just not possible. And, the point of question though is there are other airplanes flying. There's a solar airplane called solar energy, and pulse that flew around the world. But what it has been missing is the utility and the ticket market. And so um, from the general aviation side of what our aerospace does, um, we are we have developed we've got a prototype um, for a two-seat flight trainer airplane called the Sunflare. That's just a oh, yeah, piece. Let me see if I can get to you. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some pretty pictures. Um, this airplane on the bottom is the Sunfire. Um, <clears throat> and that's a prototype. That's not the final design that's required to get certified by the FAA. Um, this is actually a frame for a light square aircraft. So, you know, it's a little more detailed on that. But that airplane exists. That's taken at Central Airport. And we really are not going to have need to do this. Um, just to fly that airplane hopefully with the next few months. That's fantastic. Now, looking at this, this is kind of just like an electric car. You plug it in. Is that right? Yeah. And a lot of electric planes, it sounds like, the ones we were speaking before, are a little bit of one-offs. How are you approaching a, taking this to scale and working with this? Absolutely great question. So, um, again, unlike some of the other electric airplane projects, some of them have been home built, so they built in the garage. They made one of them just to say, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking in terms of a market. And when we launched um, the company under which the Sunflyer is housed um, in 2014, we had um, potential investors that said, we get this. But what we're doing is um, ultimately going to reduce the per, um, our operating costs for an aircraft from $60, $70 an hour, which is what it costs to operate that system 172 with a flight trigger. To three dollars an hour in electricity, wow. and so it's compelling. And again, Centennial Airport is so excited because they get all kinds of noise complaints. Um, we actually had the National Park Service come out and do um, a noise test of our single seat. She calls it our single seat technology. I just really like the electric airplane that flew, and the Park Service placed a microphone. They found it picked up the sound from it. So, yeah, and so um, I mean. It's just phenomenal, and in fact, when you have conversations about, well, we have to have some kind of noise, because people won't be doing it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the utility of the market, and so what we're doing is targeting 
flight schools. And so Spark College of Aeronautics and Technology is headquartered in Tulsa right now, which is our first customer. They put deposit for the first 25 Sunflyer 2 seat aircraft, that we call Sunflyer 2, quite a visual. Um, that we produce, and uh, they want the first 25 of them. They want to become the first, the first all electric flight school. And so uh, my business partner, George Meyer, our CEO and founder, was just up at Santa Monica Airport last weekend. And Santa Monica has been going through quite uh, a lot of difficulty, um, again, because of noise and um, that's a great real estate that somebody is trying to get to redevelop, but they want to stay in their airports. And so offering electric flight is an option to wait for them to stay. You know, to go to our airport, the emissions are done, and then the noise is just previous to all. So there's, it's just, it's all things to do with it. We are going to the market, and we want to solve the needs of these airports. Actually, here in Colorado, there's a whole other discussion, but that's on That's fantastic. Now, another question that I have, uh, I mean, clearly the, what my mind jumps to is that huge production is because of fuel costs. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, that's part of it. And then, so, how many charges does the battery have right now? Is, I mean, a lot of times you look at electric batteries and, you know, sort of like our old school, if you had a rechargeable battery, it's sort of charged it the first time and it slowly does less and less and less. How far have they come? Yeah, you wouldn't worry about it when you're in a plane that you're not totally charged. <laughs> That's a great question. That's why we're just, we selected the flight training markets because those sort of HVA or that term for the military, the missions, if you will, near a pilot in training, they go up and fly. Uh, this is just starting out. You fly for an hour to an hour and fifteen minutes at a time, and then you come back down. And that's just how this process works. And so when we're projecting that this airplane, when it goes into production after it gets certified by the FAA, will have a three-hour endurance. And so there's plenty of reserve for the flight training market. Now, if you want to buy a Sunflyer to fly across the country, it's going to be similar to your experience driving you know, your car. You know, you have to plan ahead. So we will get there, but we originally thought that we were going to be the airplane manufacturing business, but we were going to have a side deal with all companies with uh, interchangeable batteries, because originally we just thought we would change up the batteries, and instead of coming in to have the fuel truck come up and fuel you up, you change up the batteries. Well, just in a few years' time now, the superchargers for these batteries have improved such that you can supercharge, charge up your batteries on the ground um, at about the same time it takes to over your uh, airplane at gas. Wow. So, um, <laughs> again, once people start figuring this out in the middle of the but, you know, we just kind of held fast to the fact that you know, we want to open up you know, the market and encourage more people to get the pilot's license because this is a scandal too. The other part of this is that there's a huge, significant commercial pilot um, shortage. And some airlines have actually filed bankruptcy because they don't have any pilots. Um, the military, several reasons this is happening. The military has to be a lot bigger. Have you been in the Air Force Base before? Really? And how many are in the Air Force Base? So versus the fact that we have a hundred years ago, we have a hundred years ago, about 700,000 So, um, a little more than that. You know, so with that, there's not as many airplanes, there's not as many pilots, and the uh, commercial airline industry has to benefit from that military feeder system. You know, they retire from the Air Force and they fly for your work.
you know, ultimately what we are looking at. And so, again, to go back to your, your question, Kadal, um, opportunity, we're just looking at it from this perspective. And as opposed to just, oh, this is good. Let's look at it. It's kind of both. Yeah. It is still very <laughs> If you flip back to the other ones, um, you know, there's a little bit of the elf in the room, that very, oh, that very cool play, you know. <laughs> so I have a lot of questions about that play. I have one, so it's very solar panel on both sides. Yep. You guys have developed a solar panel that feeds into an electric engine, is that correct? Correct. Yep. And are you having it so they wouldn't necessarily have to refuel and it would just be constantly redoing it? And how, I mean, how long can you stay in the air So, I mean, that's in our first prototype. This is actually a glider that we turned into. Um, this is, our program is called Strata Land. And um, this is the really high altitude program. Um, what we call it. And so, um, that's something right there. He's used a little bit of jargon. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're on the vehicle. You're on the vehicle. You're on the vehicle. You're on the vehicle. And then there's the other one. So, again, the jargon is evolving too. So, when you're talking to the other person, you're on the vehicle. To answer your question, so this, um, the prototype for, this is the prototype for an aircraft that we believe we're flying. Ultimately, for three weeks, and um, there's certainly the goal that we say that we would like to maybe it could fly eventually, but you know, to be safe and to keep you know all the you know, security people happy. Um, that is a 50 day, 50, 40, 80 meters, and it's huge. And this is um, the strata we're in at 50, we're going to have a 25, and so that is going to be massive. It's all new. The solar cells around the wings are from Solero, and um, the efficiencies for these solar cells are increasing incredibly. It used to be 11% efficient. Solero is um, solar cells, I think, are 31% efficient. Where do they produce? They are manufactured now. That is, you're not going to have to worry about the yeah. <laughs> potential solar panel so issues. So we have a wonderful partnership with Solero. In fact, they're investing in us and um, you know, put their solar cells on our airplanes' wings. Because Centennial Airport is such a busy delegation airport, we're not going to do flight test the strata we're going to flight test that up at Centennial Colorado, Colorado Regional Airport. The airport is where flight test activities take place in that airport. So it's this prototype is manned, it's important. We're certainly working on avionics so that it will be unmanned or an optional. Um, but in order for us to abide by the FAA regulations when it comes to drones and how you can fly and where you can fly, we're going to flight test this manned from Ashley so we can take off from a GA airport, general aviation airport. So that's our reason for doing that. Now, to circle back to what you were speaking about, about how there's such a demand for new commercial air, uh, air pilots out there, how many, how many hours does a commercial airline pilot need? And would they be able to do it all in one stint with your <laughs> solar powered oh. aircraft? <laughs> well, that's a great, maybe a mini fringe and a couple other things. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. Um, that's a great, I don't honestly Certain amount of time. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, How many hours do they need? 1,500. It used to be 250 until in 2009 there was a horrific plane crash. I want to say about say, all the way or somewhere in New York, and it was planned to be pilot fatigue, but they would increase the amount of hours required um, to get your license from 250 to 1,500. And so when you do the math and you think about the operating costs to get you know, from here to a large commercial airplane, um, it costs right now about as much to get those 1,500 flight hours in and to become a licensed pilot than it does to get your own career. Um, and so, how the school is in, get them there, and 1% don't make it through, it's just too cost prohibitive. 
take that massive debt and then you take a job at the regional airline, you may be paid five thousand dollars a year. And so what some airlines are starting to do is to develop partnerships to try to figure out how to make this more cost effective and that's where you know our supply with the lower operating costs it starts to go into the last months, but a lot of them. Um, so right now at the Centennial Airport there's a lot of flight schools and so there's a lot of sessions once every Tuesday come out. And so when you're a, a flight instructor, you get additional time if you're an instructor. So it's kind of cool to she people get to fly out with them. And they come to like fifteen hundred dollars. That's amazing. So I'm going to take that as a shift right now, as we are saying this could, this is manned now, but it could potentially be a threat in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. To talk about drones that we're here for. I love it. So Goldman Sachs just came out with a study that said that the expected spend on drones from 2016 to 2020 is going to be $100 billion. Dollars. It's a huge amount. <laughs> and you know, it gets split up into consumer, uh, commercial, civil, and also into military. So they were saying that consumer is going to be roughly around 17 billion in this time frame. It's all in their 2020. Uh, 13 billion going to commercial, civil. Right. When do you see yourselves fitting into that market? Um, it's a very well interesting story. We have two separate companies. We've got Biospace, which is developing the strand over in it. The Biospace is also very involved in the Sunshine Project, but it's two separate companies. Um, and those can know the strand over in it, obviously. Gosh, that's a multi billion dollar industry versus. And the seven flyer, which we originally thought was going to be a multi million dollar industry, which is still nothing to you know, shy away from. But as it turns out, as we're talking now about flying taxi services and, um, you know, this, the, the seven flyer becomes almost as compelling. It's just that this is a, you know, a two and a half or five million dollar airplane, depending on which size, versus a seven flyer, which we probably are going to end up being priced around 300000 um, so, the Cessna 172, I think it's about $500,000. So, anyway, it's, um, I guess actually the first thing, sorry to interrupt you, but one of the things in true demystified form, we should probably step back a second in drones and look at a little bit of how it was developed, if you wouldn't mind going into that a little bit, and um, what are the main uses at this moment as it's being developed in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So, today's drone, and I always we hear a lot about the military drones, you know. Um, the precursor of the drones actually goes back to what was going on in World War I and World War II um, in terms of the thought process. And, you know, in World War II, there was anti rocketry. And, um, but in terms of kind of the modern day civilian drones, especially, it wasn't until the computing power of the 1980s really started with personal computers and that all started to become um, more applicable to these smaller and remote control aircraft, like RC airplanes. Oh, oh, excuse me. And so the utility for drones really has now shifted. Um, there's what I see as the commercial kind of civilian use in you know, like our kids over here. Um, <laughs> So my, brother, my brother in Central Nebraska. <laughs> um, you know, they got himself a drone for Christmas two or three years ago. A bunch of buddies are drinking beer on the back porch, and the drone gets loose and ends up in some of these yards, you know. And, and I'm like, well, you're making it really difficult for those of us who are trying to be serious about this. And a bunch of drunken buddies are out and you know, it's fine. That's a problem. But, um, there's, so I see there's that market, but we're thinking more in terms of real application. And so we talked about our student awareness. There's, um, interestingly, you know, someone asked me earlier tonight about whether we're pursuing the military market. We could, that's not really our sweet spot because we're finding for us the, um, the commercial aspects of this, whether it be 
um, or acquired detection or now. Um, so we this survey. And so we have a lot of central people talking to us because they've got paid loans and this strata we're at 15 I think it's a 70 pound payload. So that's a pretty good um, amount of the codes. I'll just put it that way. We always say we're not in the weapons business, we just provide a platform. And so that's kind of where we leave it. But yeah, certainly um, gas load detection is a real popular um, topic right now. Yeah. And um, um, mining, you know, it, it's really incredible. And it, it coming back to data, I always say, well, the data is good. And so, but that's commercial versus just something that's just a hobby or, and that civilian work is massive too. You can buy any type of thing. And so, but we really are in that utility, serious businesses that are looking to either look big quickly, capture data. Um, efficiently, and then the other thing is endurance to stay up for a long period of time until later. So you have to do that with you know, I think it's so interesting. It's one of the few industries where, really, if you think about it, a lot of things filter down from the military first into then civilian use. And this is almost the opposite. I feel like drones are one of the few things that, yes, we think of it in a military way because there's a fear base that, you know, drones are going to attack us, they're going to come after us. Um, you know, back to World War II, we're in the fear of the rocket men or anything. Um, but really, where the uses developed started on a civilian way to day to day purposes. And you know, I think it's amazing how it's getting into, as you were saying, do they, I mean, for gas detection, I'd love to hear more about that, of how that happens. Um, I know, you know, I saw for agricultural that they're doing crop dusting that really focuses, you know, a much lower atmosphere so it doesn't get everywhere in the air and goes very targeted. Um, there's so many uh, different new areas. If you want to just touch on the main ones, you think it's going to really do some, some pretty big shifts in the industry. That would be great. Well, I think you're already seeing it. Um, and just think about it and watch movies. You know what I'm talking about? The place you're going to be in. Excuse me. It's really fascinating, too. You know, you're flying in and out of it. Just an everyday life like that. Um, I think the um, some of the worst things from a commercial perspective is those who are interested in moving data more quickly than this guy. You know, when you're looking about um, the efficiencies of um, putting the payload on a satellite, a billion dollar satellite, or you have your own communication system of flying around the sky, all these things like that. But you could, and that's yours, and Mm. Look at what happened with the Great Recession because information was getting received, you know, fractions of seconds earlier than this or that. Um, you start to get creative and think about the benefits of moving data quicker. Um, there's a big benefit to that. And so I think um, and that impacts, let's just say, the financial world. Um, and so, <laughs> um, as everybody's trying to move more out and quicker, this is just another way to say this is more simple, economical, faster. And then, and then there's, you go back to the eyes in the sky. And in fact, these cameras, it's just incredible what you can detect or see. Um, there's good this and that. There's also, you know, that kind of stuff in that too. But I, I really think it is those people, I keep going back to say that we're these people that are concerned about data and how quickly you can move it. Or how much of it you can get, or how close you can get, and, and, and see. So. And how about regulation for that? I mean, let's say Goldman Sachs or any of these big trading places want to have their drone really information faster than anyone else to get some markets to trade, and you know, a millisecond faster than others. How do we regulate? all these drugs that may be in the sky for individual financial institutions or, you know, any kind of commercial business like that. So that's why the um, <clears throat> FAA, I'll just take what's fair to the FAA, certainly, but now all the drugs have to be registered and there's certain, so honestly, it's still trying to be figured out how that's all going to be. 
Um, and that's why for what we're doing with the spread of rain, we're going to places where, you know, there are places where you have to go to fly aircraft like this. Um, and places like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of this, the, again, not only the tax code, it's just, okay, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what's happening in this world. So we take what we know, and there is so much, I mean, I haven't even gotten into the whole, um, you know, who we were Facebook are trying to do, which is wonderful, just to bring the internet and communication to you know, rural areas, the whole country, and stuff. And there's a lot of goodness, but it's happening so quickly. Sometimes they just, they can't, our government, our, those that set the rules just can't keep up. And this is absolutely really quickly. Um, and then you can find that there are exceptions that are made in certain cases. And there's, I have to be very vague for the reason, but it's pretty cool to be in this industry to say, you're ready, the government's not. Right. Now, in the field of variables right now, who are the other current players with you? And who do you see some players and potentially edging out in different industries going forward? Yeah. And what time is that? Is yeah. that five years, ten years? What do we expect? So, for Shadow Hornet, which is a, a big airplane, we have um, we compare ourselves to the, just the same predators. Um, and those are known as you know, the carry weapons and things like that. Um, there really aren't, we can't really make great comparisons, all we can make nice comparisons. And again, like I say, we're in the platform business. We don't know what we'll, this airplane will be used for, but um, you know, we do just for um, purposes that we have to establish a business because we'll use example. We'll walk. And we, but we focus more on things like endurance, you know, how long we can stay up, how long we can project that we can stay up. This is not going yet. Um, it's important to make that um, distinction. And so it is, we really can't compare to establish that, unfortunately. So, um, and we don't know what we don't know So, um, this is kind of a moving thing. And um, we have been contacted by a lot of people, people that have. As I said, sensors, things that they want to get up into the sky to do certain things. Um, and, you know, and they're looking for a line, basically, like I said, versus a billion dollars that line. It's very expensive to, to put up in the space and then to keep it up there. And then one of the one of the benefits that we tout is that um, your satellites were up and there's all the space junk that's floating around. And our airplane can eventually come back down. Um, so, um, yeah, it's just, it's a whole different, uh, you have to really think it through very different things. And this is, you know, you're, it seems like it's a completely different market than, than the videos that you see, if you Google drones, you know, in the world. I came across one in Japan where they have a flamethrower attached to it that's burning down things off of, you know, high wires as a utilitarian thing for civilian purposes. But um, it's pretty amazing to see something like that from Karen Clinton or yeah. you see it. But it seems like it's a very different, almost a stratosphere, literally, yeah. of where you guys are versus where a lot of drone market is currently, which seems the lower uh, lower to earth area. Yeah. This um this drone rent is intended to fly, you know, above commercial airports. So it gets up in pretty high. Um, I haven't mentioned this, I don't unfortunately have any photos of it, but we, Firespace, uh, spun out a company called Sound of Falcon UAS. That is, um, we believe that it's actually happening down in Albuquerque, we spun it out, it's under different management. Um, some of us are founders in that company, but we believe it's the first electric airplane production. Um, and that was to be a UAV, it's all, it's all solar electric. Um, and that one, I think, is the same as the other feet. But that endurance on that airplane right now is four or five hours we project that can go eight hours. And so, yeah, there's just all, I mean, and there's all these sites, it's a small UAS on the air system, in the small categories, like 14 foot wing. So, I mean, there's micro, there's all these sizes, and there's a big, massive airplane that makes it on the air So, yeah, it's, it is, um, it is, so um, we 
who was talking in a meeting this afternoon, we really, um, we went to move into um, the next phase, and our company to go to take more in terms of just scale, yeah. to making it bigger, you know, like put more solar cells on the moon, so we're going to continue to improve um, their efficiency. And so we're trying to think, you know, so that we can scale it so I have caught all the questions so far, <laughs> and just because I find this so interesting, but I want to take a quick second, because I am sure some of you have some questions as well. Uh, I'm in the audience that might have a quick burning question. Yeah. So thanks for being here, Diane. Um, so I had a, I was curious about your thoughts on security, and not with not in terms of you know drones with flamethrowers on them, although that's terrifying. <laughs> but specifically, like with these autonomous planes and just vulnerability of, of hacks. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 Our program probably just isn't mature enough yet. We haven't gotten to, um, because we are just getting ready for a test of life, that was first to airplane. It hasn't really come off much yet. Um, we've had some, again, I'll just say, interesting visitors and um, asking us to think through this. And um, but you're right, it is, it is frightening to think about what could actually happen. And so thank you for bringing that up because um, oftentimes I find that the entrepreneurs that I work with, we think about in terms of all the goodness. You know, this is this is going to save the world, um, and then until either something happens or you know, what's your threat reduction, how are you going to address this? And, and, and I'm sure. So I apologize. I don't have a great answer for you. We're just I think we're just not that. Mature, but it's a, it's a great, great question. Somewhere maybe it's a union of blockchain and drones in the future. Is there another question? For pilots training on the electric motor and then going over to a regular motor, yeah. uh, is there a big difference? Yeah, so there is actually a, that's a great question. So we are hoping to get help um, and mass hours. Of course, the nod to go back and I mean, the internal combustion engine has a lot of moving parts. And the electric motor is basically one. And so the, the gauges, the information you're getting, instead of tracking the fuel, you're tracking the battery chart, basically. But, um, and I, I'm pulling on old aircraft and we've got the carburetor, they're pulling things out. And so we do acknowledge that <laughs> if you want to fly an internal combustion engine, you're going to eventually have to get trained on how to do that. Right? And there is a whole other aspect to that training. Um, here, like I said, it is, you still have to um, understand how to interpret the data, but you're not as consumed with to make sure. So, yeah, it is. It just depends on kind of where you want to go with it. So, but it is, we do believe it does help um, get the hours. And it's a great starting platform. It's not quite as popular. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I have uh, spoken to a uh, commercial helicopter tourist company out in New York. They have them in Boston, in Chicago, and of course the Grand Canyon. And the big complaint is the noise. Their uh, ability to fly is restricted by the city because of the noise. So I'm wondering if you're doing anything with rotating uh, aircraft yeah. uh, as opposed to fixing. You know, not rotating in the sense of a helicopter, but we are, um, we have a lot of new companies come to us and one company that has is a company called XTI Aircraft. They have they're using inducted fan technology, which is not rotor, but it's you know um, they are developing um, a, a business jet that has a vertical takeoff and a vehicle. And so you can land your um called the trifan. Yeah. The trifan on the roof of the building and go out and, and they want to hybridize it and that's what we can um, but it takes so much energy to be able to lift an aircraft off of just batteries and then flip over to them. Anyway, um, that's about the closest we will come. We will come. And that, 
That is not solving the building problem. That's just trying to make the concept of a business jet that can take off and land vertically, you know, the Osprey. But for a lot of business jet, with all the comforts and they are they are getting a lot of attention because you can everybody is thinking, okay, we can't solve the ground transportation problem. I'm saying that on the you know, we'll just wait to get that. Have you ever thought of any uh, consumer product? Uh, I mean, for three hundred thousand dollars, that's getting close to an expensive car. Mm -hmm. um, or exactly. in their backyard. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, this, we have all these euphemisms. It really is unlimited what we can. I mean, we are maybe. 20 of us trying to do. We have these two programs that are uh, working on three other airplane companies projects because of our electric propulsion expertise. And um, if anything, we're getting criticized because we are trying to take on too much. What we're doing now is trying to think, and that's why I'm saying we're trying to think in terms of scalability. But there's just so much coolness that people haven't thought of yet. And so there's this thing that everybody's like, we're going to get that out. better are drones getting every year? So either of that or the enabling technologies. You know, can you put a number on it and <laughs> the change? Yeah, I, I, I unfortunately can't. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would have to say though that um, you know, the fact that it's, it's just you know, they're being given us Christmas gifts basically. I mean, it's becoming so mainstream. Um, it is concerning because I do read some of the daily newsletters that come out about drones that are interfering with you know, commercial flight. Um, or how about the enabling technologies for your aircraft? Oh, I'm sorry. Or you yeah, one. absolutely. Um, so we'll talk about um, electric motors. We're about to announce some really cool partnerships with some um, really amazing partners. The, the battery energy density before, one of the challenges that we were having, say, two years ago, is that the battery manufacturers we're making so much money off the car industry, and again, you think about Tesla, now they're in the battery business, you know? Um, and the battery manufacturers were like, oh, you know, again, the backs are out, you're not going to fly all hundred your airplane. <laughs> um, and now they're really, oh my gosh, we're going to miss an opportunity here. So, um, that is really the key to all of this. I mean, a lot of people have been out for a long time. A lot of the have been out for a long time. But um, it is being able to um, increase the endurance is really in these batteries. That is such a key part to our success and what we believe that we can achieve. We just needed to finally convince or the battery manufacturers need to be motivated to improve their products. And, and that is rapidly changing now. Um, now switching over to uh, electric motor, uh, uh, is there a certain amount of weight that needs to be cut from the rest of the yeah. body of the, the aircraft? Yeah, all the airplanes are all composite, very light, and um, you know our pilot we put him on a diet too. <laughs> Because 
you know, there's software that tells these battery cells what to do, and it's an actual software flaw from some very outdated, you know, older software. You may have heard the joke that some of these F35s, they still have 386 computers on board. I mean, things like, I mean, that's just how slow some, I don't know if any of this is true, but that's what we always been talking about. But, um, you know, as, as there's a, a more of a demand for this, there could be improvements in there to figure out these software budgets and, and uh, there has been a lot of progress in that, so. Is China or Japan coming through with any technology comparable to what we're doing here? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, and I, I have a few statistics here. I, I did not know this, that um, the largest, a, a private Chinese company called DJI actually has a 70% share of the civilian government. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, and we spoke with the Chinese companies Switzerland, uh, both on the general aviation side and on the north side. Um, we just we just are keeping all our options open right now, but absolutely certain certainly um, you know, we're all trying to figure all this out. And so we've just been very cautious in who we talk to and um, try to be um, collaborative but yet cautious and sort of the order of the day. We just we have we have our hands full <laughs> already. Um, but we are at the point now where we have a lot of innovation companies in the US saying we think our airplanes benefit from what we do become electric, we were let's do something together, and so we, if anything, we're challenged by just trying to stay focused on where we can build the really is and so we can find out. Sounds like there's a lot to be done, and like, the more people right now pushing it, the better. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I'm interested uh, any of the enterprises you're running right now uh, offering products for sale because we're running evaluations around the country looking for something like this. Sure. Um, so our Silent Falcon um, company that we spun out, they're actually in low rate production and they're making sales. They've sold them and that's Silent Falcon and UAS Technologies. Right. Um, again, both of our own projects are really fairly early, um, and our sun fire still needs to get certified um, by the FAA, which we think, and we have the FAA already very involved in what we're doing. So we're projecting, hoping that within three years um, of our first flight, we'll be able to um, have a certified airplane. Um, but we expect to have probably three more iterations of our own design before it's the, what they call a conforming design that the FAA approves and certifies and we can only manufacture to that spec. And if we change anything on that airplane, we have to go through the very certification process. Did I really answer your question? Yeah. You did. <laughs> your, your comments about the federal government moving more slowly than you are uh, bears out. Do you have any insight into their review of the limitation of line of sight and 400 foot elevation? Yeah. Um, not so much yet. Um, I wish there was someone here from the Sound Club because they're more dealing with that because they're further along in their maturity process than we are. So I, I couldn't really give you an answer on that. I could find an answer for you. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're experiencing that. Yeah. We have found, we have, I would say, a different approach, but there was, I understand that over the years been kind of a tenuous relationship with the FAA and the government in general when it comes to this industry. We've tried to take a different approach and tried to be very positive and we actually hired a uh, former FAA attorney, and he is the one who jumps to facilitate these relationships and to include them and you know, ask questions and try to be as collaborative if that's even possible. <coughs> um, it seems to be helping, certainly, because there can't be a very combative. Is that quick and collaborative or just? You know, as collaborative as they can be, as quick as they can be. But they actually call us and say, we want to get together 
over and I, I force people to just to go back and to say, well, if you're not happy to be here, you shouldn't be here because we're not going to change. As much as you'd love to change us and change our culture, so um, that is, I guess, certainly well as far as what I got into into investing. Um, my ex husband and I had an information technology services company that we sold in 2004, and subsequently got divorced and went our separate ways. And I just felt like I wanted to get back with other entrepreneurs. Two of them, you know, two great women are here tonight. Um, and there's so many great ideas and not enough experience doing this, launching your own idea. That's, that's why we live what we do. Um, we can't do that every, everywhere. Um, and I just wanted to help him get back, and now I have, I probably made about a, well, probably about a dozen um, angel investments. And what I would do differently in the future is it would be a requirement that I would be involved somehow. Because, um, you know, it's one thing to write a check and expect somebody to pay you a great return, but the concept of angel investing means that you're going to be involved, that you're going to help make introductions or um, help with marketing, but you have to be involved. And, and that's how you learn. That's, that's where we grow, and the benefit, I think, to us as investors is to think about our clients. I didn't even think about any of this. I've learned so much, and you don't get this kind of experience. Like this, unless you're not involved. 